two perspectives actually address two paths to debt stabilization. So part of our brand, and it works better in a business crowd like this, but part of our organization's brand and, and strategy moving forward is to educate younger business leaders about the need to at least stabilize debt. If you go back a decade, we talked a lot about balanced budgets and and for a period of time, there actually were legitimate plans on the table that could have balanced a budget in America. I would say that the uh, re-education that needs to take place is just to understand his, from a historical context, the perils of our current trajectory. So let me s set that and, and William can correct me um, where I'm wrong. But we're roughly $30 trillion in debt today. That is quite manageable from the greatest uh, country for the greatest country and the greatest economy in the history of the world. The problem is, and we're a millennial-led organization, and so we're, we're daring enough to think in a 30-year time frame. The problem is that under current law, and this is CBO's projections, not my opinion, is that we are on a trajectory before Build Back Better to somewhere in the neighborhood of $150 trillion in debt 30 years from now. So we're going to release in the first few months of the year a pretty comprehensive document that will p literally piece by piece in terms of legislative proposals show you what it looks like for that 100% debt to GDP ratio today, what it looks like going to 200, and then what it looks like if you make incremental reforms. All right, this takes it to 190 over 30 years. This it takes it to 150. So this is not the kind of stuff that every last voter takes an interest in. It's our belief that we can present it in a way that begins to make at least business leaders across the country curious about the path we're on. We're equally to blame for this problem. We just do it differently. Um, they create social entitlement programs. They, 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 they give, they, she talks about bailouts. The, the amount of malfeasance across this country in blue states and cities is insane. It is insane. We have a balanced budget. We're not allowed to spend more money than we bring in. That's why I like being on the state side, right? <laughs> because I think from a federal perspective, it's like you just said earlier. You know, we have both parties contributing. But I think if COVID has showed us anything as a nation, it's that state government is your last line of defense from horrible policies coming out of D.C., where William fights the good fight all the time, right? But when you're, when, when, when you're the underdog, it's a lonely place where the, the states can push back, right? I mean, when you talk about healthcare, you talk about medic, you know, the Medicaid expansion. We didn't take it. That was up to each individual state. And when I'm with my counterparts from around the country, you hear the pain, right? Tim Griffin from Arizona, when they took it, they took it in like a hybrid. And they've been spending since, since, they, since it was voted to say yes, trying to figure out how to get out of it because it was all glazed over as, oh, you won't have to pay anything for a few years. When I debated my counterpart who was running, uh, when, we, when the governor and I were running, I mean, that's what I said to her. She kept saying, because their whole platform was, we're going to expand Medicaid. We're going to expand Medicaid here in South Carolina. Look at all the people we're leaving hanging because we're not going to do this. And she said, but we, we're not saying we're going to raise taxes. And I said, well, listen, the government, the state government pays for about six things, right? And if you're not talking about cutting K through 12 or higher education or road spending, if you're not talking about cutting any of that, where are you going to pay it when the bill comes? Because nobody gets a free lunch. Eventually, everybody pays the piper and then they go dead silent because they, they just because just like you said, they try to bring those policies into the state level where we'll worry about how we're going to pay for it when the bill comes. And I think James Smith actually said that in a debate against the governor, like, well, we're about how to pay for that when, that, when, that, when the bill comes. When you gotta get more money, well, these businesses are doing so well. Um, you know, they, they, don't, they don't need it. <laughs> yeah. You know, we, they're, they're making all this money. And so, you know, and there is a fine line there. I mean, you know, but 75, 80% of the, the workforce in this country are employed by, by the free market. I mean, you know, so again, we reformed the tax code because businesses were relocating to other countries. Mm -hmm. South Carolina has done an incredible job of being business friendly. We have foreign direct investment. We have small businesses. We have just a, a thriving economy. Go, go to California. I mean, right now in, in L.A., businesses are literally boarding up because of the policies that they have put in place. There's no actual law enforcement because you can just 
go to a Louis Vuitton and take everything and walk out and nobody says anything. I mean, and do you think that they're going to restock their store? <laughs> or do you think they're going to stop? I was, I was thinking about Dreams going shopping. Like that, right? I was thinking like, <laughs> everything's free, but, but, just walk in again, and grab it. But, it's a dream. Again, you know, <laughs> t Tesla relocates because of the, the environmental and because of the uh, regulatory market in California. California is going to collapse. I mean, they, they are already so far in debt, it is insane. They don't know what they're going to do. Their delegation in Washington is trying to get the federal government to bail them out. And I'm sitting here, I'm like, South Carolina is not going to write a check because y'all can't balance your, balance your checkbook. So the state, states are having this issue now, too. We as an organization have been fighting back against all the federal spending bills that have been coming out and really appreciate the congressman's hard work and being at the forefront of those bills to say, hey, we're not, South Carolina is not going to write these checks. And we tell our constituents that, too. We're not going to write these checks. We should not be responsible for bailing out states that have been irresponsible. Like, that's not what we're about as constituents. Currently in the House leadership, uh, their average age is 80, 80 years, six months. Their average, their cumulative service between the speaker, the leader, and the whip is like 140 years. Um, like, that's a problem. That's a big problem. So we do need term limits. We're never going to have them. There's a chance that we could grandfather in the current members that would vote on it. That might get it across the finish line. I still don't think it'll happen. Um, but I fully support it, and I will keep fighting for it because at some point we're going to hit a turning point where we have to do something, and I think that that's, that's part of the solution. I mean, we're seeing it right now. Inflation is part of it, and, you know, but when you start talking about inflation, they say, well, that's a supply chain issue. It's a scarcity issue. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a Federal Reserve problem. And so, you know, every time that we argue one angle, they come over here. It's like, we can't spend this money well, because of debt. And then they say, well, your 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act create, put $2 trillion on, so we should be able to do the same. And I'm like, okay. I mean, but again, I don't think there's a lot of people in Congress that view it seriously. Um, I, there's other, one other thing we haven't talked about. The reason we're able to do all of this, because we are the leader in the global economy, is because of the dollar. And as long as we have the dollar, we will be able to continue borrowing. But as we increase our debt, when we hit, so Greece had to go to austerity measures at 180 percent. Um, so 180 percent of their GDP, when that was their debt, they literally had to just cut all their entitlement programs, and it was really, really problematic for their for their country. Um, so when we hit 200%, I mean, eh, maybe we're a big country and we got a big economy. Okay, 250, 300. Like the, the global economy is going to say, well, hold on, guys. Why are we going to keep the dollar as our global reserve currency when you're doing all of this? Because essentially we're devaluing our economy at the expense of theirs. Same thing that Democrats are trying to do to get the federal government to bail out states. So why is the global community going to bail out the United States for our bad policy. So the same conversation is going to be happening in 10, 20 years. But again, the global reserve currency conversation is very hard. China doesn't have the, 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 the faith in the, the, the global community is not have faith in China to be a fair arbiter. Um, the European countries are too small. There's not a good alternative. But as we see, uh, there's conversations around a, a bucket of currencies that would create a global reserve, reserve currency, crypto. I mean, there's all these different variables that you can kind of, if we lose the dollar, we're done. The economic impact of that bipartisan infrastructure bill is zero, uh, which is another kind of fascinating nonpartisan perspective on when the left says this is going to transform the American economy mm -hmm. and pins up there going, well, we scored a zero just to kind of a net nothing. And this is what gets me excited as a guy who a few years ago was saying, hey, this is all going to get bad. We ought to start talking about it again. Mm -hmm. When we think about MMT and interest rates in general, it helps that this has um, become fodder for kitchen table conversations. It's the first teachable moment in my lifetime about inflation. And you're right, there, you know, in, inevitably the left will blame it on uh, you know, shipping containers and, and won't talk about fiscal or monetary policy being a, a contributing factor. Right. Well, so that's where I was headed, though, is MM, the MMT guys, if you'll, and it's hard, you got to drink a couple cups of coffee when you do it. But if you'll watch a debate right now, you've got some great economist, one of the guys who advises our organization, is a guy named Brian Riedel from Manhattan, and he goes toe to toe with a lot of the really respectful proponents of MMT. 
and modern monetary theory. And when the thing, you know, the, the whole theory sort of loses its leaves if interest rates ever go up. So you really, this conversation dead ends into their belief that interest rates will remain low forever. Like until the Lord returns, interest rates will be low. But to be fair, and I actually asked uh, Chair Powell this last year, I said, do you factor in our debt to interest rates? And he said, absolutely not. This is some of the most magnificent math that our country ought to begin doing quick. And it's the way we talk about this every time we do an event like this. So you can't guarantee, as all of you, particularly the bankers and financial services folks in the room know, you can't guarantee anything about interest rates, except that it looks like the next two meetings, you know, early next year, we're probably going to have an increase because of inflation. <clears throat> and that's not uh, some proprietary information. The whole country learned that on CNBC this morning. Um, <laughs> Here's what's so fascinating about $30 trillion in debt, let alone the $150 trillion we'll have when I enter retirement. At $30 trillion in debt, and by the way, debt, to, this is really unbelievable that the left has gotten away with the talking points that they have about why borrowing is good because interest rates are low. Most federal debt is, is uh, short term, and, and a lot of you guys in the room know this. And so it actually has to be refinanced effectively, if you want to think about it, on uh, sort of household terms. And so there's no guarantee that today's debt is always at 1.7%. So let's imagine a one percentage point adjustment across federal debt, which is totally plausible in the next decade. One percentage point on 30 trillion is pretty easy math. That's $300 billion in annual debt service. One percentage point. Now, God forbid we go back to the 90s. I don't think anybody realistically thinks we go back to the before the 90s. But if you go back to a scenario where you've got four or five percent interest rates, you've got a completely cataclysmic trajectory for America. So the MMT guys, they're really comfortable and really confident until you start talking about the certainty with which their theory relies on, on rates always being historically low. Even as the reserve says they can't stay low because we've got an inflation problem. I think if we talk a language, like, you know, you always hear, say it so you could sell it to a third grader. Because I think the American public tunes out when we start getting in. I mean, this is a very sophisticated group in this room, right? But the normal person who's listening to the news, when you start talking GDP and you start talking interest rates and you start talking global market, those people just shut off the TV, right? Because they're like, say it to me in plain English. You know, it would, if, you, if we would go on TV and say, listen, if I keep paying people uh, $15 an hour to work at the coffee shop across the street, your cup of coffee is now going to be $10 a cup. And can you afford that? People would stop and listen because that is relevant to their day-to-day -day lives. But when we start talking in this very big, it almost is like um, bizarro world, right? Like just now when you talk trillions, I remember when I was a kid and you would say, oh my God, that costs like a bajillion dollars, right? And everybody laughed about it. That's where we are now. Right. Like we're hearing these big numbers and everybody's going like, this is so far out of my context that I'm just turning it all off. We have to get back to talking plain English with very real world scenarios so that the average person, because we need the majority of people to get out and get involved, understand. And the only way we're gonna do that if we start talking plain English on every level of government and make real world examples that the normal gray collar worker understands how this is gonna affect him and his kids tomorrow. But if we keep talking big and we keep talking using acronyms, I think we just push too many people away from the conversation. We weren't fiscal conservatives because we wanted to own the libs or we weren't fiscal conservatives because it was great politics on the street corner. It was, it's born out of the idea of stewardship. We call this series of events our stewardship series. And what I think we need to use the teachable moment of an inflation boost, however long it lasts, we need to use it to explain that the conservative heart actually cares about stewardship and we care even in the most prosperous society in the history of the world about preserving, providing and preserving a safety net for the least of these. And if you think about who's hurt the worst by the primary uh, consequences of massive deficit spending, 
it's almost always going to be middle and lower income people, right? The grocery store is a lot more expensive for working class families than it was. So that's one. Longer term, austerity is the extreme example, but longer term, I honestly believe I'll live right through the federal government not being able to fulfill promises that it made. Well, this is sort of the Arthur Brooks perspective on conservatism. We got to explain to people that we, we actually care about people. We, you know, we're not a bunch of like hardcore capitalists who only care about these issues because we think it's going to somehow affect our portfolio. No, I'm, I literally am drawn to this set of issues because I think if we're good stewards of this great country, it'll be even greater in the decades to come. And I worry that fiscal mismanagement today actually means that we can't fulfill promises. Social the Security is the best example. The last thing I'd say to you, because you're all South Carolinians and you get to play a more fun part of the presidential process, particularly in primaries, than the rest of us is I'll go back to the very first meeting of the Millennial Debt Commission, and William was a part of this, and Marco Rubio said something that was both disappointing but I think true and profound, and, and it's that this whole subject matter is really going to require the leadership of a conservative president. It's the kind of thing that just requires enough political capital that you have to have a president who believes in it and is on board. And so I would suggest that just, uh, you know, with a cycle that really will begin around here next year, mm -hmm. um, that the business community in Greenville could have this one really important influence on, um, on that conversation early on. And our organization is going to go on early next year with Senator Ernst and, uh, and, and one of uh, Congressman Timmons' young colleagues um, in Iowa to have a similar conversation about how, hey, if, if conservatives in these states want to not just pick who, but sort of what conservatism is about moving forward, just be aware that you, you've got an opportunity, those of us in other parts of the country, envy.